This bland gray box doesn't look like much, but let me tell you, it is pretty freaking cool, and I'm very excited about the possibilities with this thing in my shop. Uh, this is the RD Tech DPS 5020 power supply. It's a DC to DC step back converter with a maximum output of 50 volts and 20 amps. So you have a 1000 watt unit in this little box, and that is already pretty impressive. It has the typical uh, maximum voltage and maximum amperage settings. And the coolest part, right, the reason why I chose this unit is that it has a USB port on the back that you can use to program it. So it is basically a CNC power supply. You can uh, you know, read the settings for uh, maximum voltage and maximum amperage. You can change them from the computer. You can check and see how much it's putting out at any point in time. You can turn it off, you can turn it on. You can do all the things you do uh, from the menus on this power supply from the computer instead, and then tie it in to other automated shop processes. And that, that is what's gonna make this thing really useful and really cool. You know, cause these, these constant um, output supplies are already commonly used for stuff like electrolysis like and anodization. You know, just things where you have a chemical reaction you wanna spur on by adding current and then control the speed of the reaction by controlling the amount of current. But where I wanna go with this instead is trying out something called ECM, uh, electrochemical machining. It's basically a poor man's version of EDM, uh, electro discharge machining. Now in EDM, you use a power supply that can put out like kiloamps at kilovolts at a kilohertz rate, and basically it just zaps your workpiece a bajillion times to slowly erode it away. And that can give you some very fine surface finishes, and you can do some really intricate cuts because your cutter, you know, it's not like a spinning end mill where you have deflection and the tool width and all that stuff to worry about. It's just an electrode, right? So any, like a bent piece of wire can be your cutter. And you can get like weird undercuts and funny shapes and stuff and go really tight in the corners because your, your wire can be really thin and all that cool stuff. The downside with EDM is the power supply because it's, you know, uh, kiloamps at kilovolts and kilohertz and it's all that craziness is also very expensive, like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars well beyond the budget of a typical home shop. Uh, so ECM uh, lets you add salt water to the mix and then turn that purely electrical reaction into a chemical reaction now. So you can do a lot more with a lot less power supply. So, you know, this little 20 amp supply that costs 75 bucks all in for like the board, the case, the USB add-on, everything 75 bucks will let me do roughly the same thing. You know, <laughs> of course it's not gonna be you know, quite as nice. It's gonna be slower and whatever, but I'm pretty sure this will work because I've actually already done a test and sure enough, I can, uh, I can dig into some aluminum just using current and salt water. So I took this little uh, piece of scrap stuff, uh, set up a pump, basically flowing salt water over this, just flooding it, and then I hooked up all the wires and took an electrode, and just by hand, I put this little dent in this piece of aluminum. And that is pretty cool. I mean, it's just like 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> it wasn't very fast, but uh, I think I can make this a much, much faster thing and much, uh, much more accurate too. And then because it's uh, you know programmable, I can tie this in to a CNC machine, and then no matter how long it takes, it doesn't really matter because I won't be I won't be there having to do it, right? So my thought is I can put this on a 3D printer and turn that into uh, kind of a makeshift mill, right? And I imagine I could probably get like I don't know a cubic inch and a, a cubic one to two cubic inches per hour i think is a pretty reasonable guess on what i'll be able to hit with this thing maybe even up to three and like yeah that's not a faster material moving rate but again we're talking about uh you know machining metal on a 3d printer <laughs> and usually a 3d printer takes like four hours to make a plastic part so if it takes four hours to make a metal part well that's that's already you know a pretty good improvement and uh, to go back to what i said before about funny shaped electrodes you might see there's a little bit of a, a bump there in the middle of that divot, right? And that's actually because on this electrode, it has a center drill mark. And that ended up transferring right there. You know, even with the way it's moving around and like up and down and side to side, it still managed to make an imprint from the electrode. And you know, that, that just goes to show you that there's, there's some possibility here for doing really intricate cuts. And again, on a 3D printer. So yeah, that, that is why I'm so excited. Now, of course, you know, what part do I want to make of this? Well, of course, it's a bike part. <laughs> you, know, you might remember this from a, a video I did a year and a half ago where I had this part off a, a vintage bike of mine that I crashed and, you know, this thing broke right there. And I did the CAD for it by photographing it and mocking it up and made a 3D print and it fit just fine, but it was, it was far, far too weak. 
And then uh, about a year ago, I got my hands on a kiln and tried casting to make a replacement. But uh, it turns out casting is way harder than my first boy on YouTube makes it look. So uh, that was a, a total flop. But now I think I have a solution because of course I, <laughs> I could hire this out to CNC shop and have it done in you know a week or two but uh i've got i've got uh, disease and i insist on diying absolutely everything so here we are <laughs> and i think that you know, this has other applications too right here's a derailleur hanger uh here's another part that's not a derailleur hanger but looks you know pretty similar and you know these you can't buy now because it's from a vintage bike and they just don't make this exact model anymore these you can buy but if there's any point in the future where you couldn't buy them you could probably make them from the same process and now that again is just really freaking cool now, uh, as for some more stuff on the unit, uh, as I mentioned, it's only 75 bucks, so very affordable on AliExpress. Uh, I did pay full price for mine, and I will put a link below, uh, just a regular link, not affiliate, none of that nonsense. I, I don't want to have any of my reviews be you know, tainted by corporate dollars or whatever. Uh, and these, these models also, they've been reviewed uh, pretty thoroughly by Dave Jones on the EEV blog. Uh, and if you haven't seen his videos before, I highly recommend his channel. It's just all a great, great wealth of knowledge for learning you know about uh literal engineering and design on pcbs and all that sort of stuff um, but he did a review on this model specifically and that one that one didn't go so hot because i, I just want to point out that in his early uh version of the board there was an issue with a ceramic capacitor that was placed uh right by a screw terminal and that ended up making it crack and short and then the board went up in smoke basically immediately but i'm happy to announce that that issue has been fixed on this revision of the board that is no longer a problem it seems to be you know rock solid in my testing uh, and i think this will last you know a good long while uh, i will point out that the assembly process on this unit was a bitch and a half <laughs> the uh, the instructions weren't weren't terribly good and there were a few solder joints in here that i personally found to be entirely impossible but i did work out another uh, wiring method that again does seem to work and I'll make a separate video on that uh, just after this one just because my, my videos run long enough already I'm I already talked too much so let's I'll split that the assembly tips up into a separate video and for now we're gonna head over to the computer and talk more about the protocol this thing uses Lucky for us, RD Tech provides some pretty good documentation on how to talk with the power supply. I downloaded this PDF from their AliExpress page back when I bought the device, and I do strongly encourage that you do the same. As you might see here, this dock is version 1.2, and that would imply there's a version 1.0 and 1.1 that are already out of date. And they might move on to version you know, 1.3, 1.4, 2.0 in the future. And if you don't download this thing when you buy your device, you might have trouble finding the PDF that corresponds to what you bought in the future. So I do encourage you to you download it when you buy it. Uh, also, you just know that if you're buying yours, you know, two, three years after I shoot this video, they might be on version 2.0 and some stuff might have changed from what I'm showing here. Now, the protocol is something called Modbus, which is an industrial standard for industrial devices doing industrial stuff. Right? It's one of those uh, rusty, crusty things they developed in the 70s and they haven't updated it since. Um, this is my first time using Modbus, but by reading their PDF and the Wikipedia article and just messing around with some Python code, I did come up with a good proof of concept uh, that we're going to go over. But before we get there, I want to cover how this protocol works on the, you know, wire level in terms of like ones and zeros and the nitty gritty parts just cover that at least briefly so when you go to the python and you see how much easier it gets and how much of that rust and cruft really cover up with a modern programming language and a modern library for it uh you'll just you'll appreciate it a lot more okay uh now modbus is a serial protocol uh very much like what you get on any arduino right so if you've done any arduino programming you do a, a serial dot print and you can send a string from your Arduino to your computer and it will spit it out in the terminal. And likewise, you can uh, you know, send characters back from your terminal to your Arduino and then read them there. And you've probably written functions where you're, you're parsing out that text and you, can, you know how messy that can get and how fast, right? So Modbus uh, takes that raw serial communication and adds a level on top of it to say what structure those things should follow. And that just makes it easier for you know, devices on both ends to be able to talk to each other. And then it helps, you know, the uh, manufacturers of these industrial devices to have have something come between them. Otherwise, you know, they'd all be, <laughs> they'd all come up with their own standard and 
Nobody wanted that. So they came up with a mod bus and now we're sticking to it. <laughs> so the, uh, the overall structure is that you can think of um, kind of like a mod bus uh, message as being a sentence, right? And then that sentence is full of bytes, which are words. And these sentences are supposed to have uh, an opening of a, a gap of um, basically a blank space to delineate the whole sentence, kind of like you'd have a, a period from the prior sentence or that space after the period to delineate your sentence starting. And then a byte for the address code, like who you're talking to, uh, a byte for a function code, like what you want them to do, uh, and then however many data bytes you want, which is, you know, specifics on what they're doing. And then this thing called a CRC, a cyclic, cyclic redundancy check. So actually, I guess CRC check is kind of redundant, but <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, you have the CRC. We'll, we'll get to that a bit more in a minute. Now, in a Modbus message, every byte is 10 bits. And this is not something we're going to deal with in the Python. Again, Python will cover all of this for us, but I want to cover it because it's Kind of interesting, right? You've probably heard before that a byte is eight bits. So what's the deal with it being 10 here in a Modbus message? Well, the thing is in serial communication, um, the signals, like the ones and zeros get interpreted by simply reading the voltage on that wire at your specified baud rate. So if you say baud rate of 9,600, then 9,600 times per second, uh, the recipient will you know, check the voltage on the input, incoming wire and then check, is it five volts? Okay, that's a one. Or is it zero volts? Pull the ground, that's a zero. And it just keeps on doing that. And with it checking that way, it can't necessarily tell where a byte actually begins, right? Because it's like if you have, um, if you have the number three, right? Just play old number three. How many zeros are in front of the number three? Or how many zeros are after the number three? You have 3.00000, how many zeros are there? You, you can't tell. Yeah, you can put as many as you want and it's all the same. So in order for a uh, serial device to tell where a byte is supposed to begin, you have to have a start bit and a stop bit. And that's what brings it from eight to 10. And then in the middle between them, you've got your eight bits of data. So it's really in the end, it ends up being like any other byte, but you need to have that special uh, you know, start and stop because of the way serial communication works. Now the parity here is something different. Uh, this is a extra bit you can add to help confirm that none of the data was corrupted in transit. Because, you know, when you have a signal on a wire going through an industrial environment where there's big induction motors and plasma cutters running that put out EMF and all that electrical noise, that can induce uh, currents on the wire that might corrupt the message you're trying to send. And a parity bit can help you sometimes catch when that happens. Not all the time, but it is a check you can add. Now, RDTech did not add that here on every byte because they end up using a CRC, which is like a parity for the entirety of the message. And that does a much better job at making sure none of the data was corrupted. And if the uh, computer gets a message from the power supply and the CRC does not check out, then it can you know, request that data again and keep requesting it until the message finally makes it across uncorrupted. This ends up being exactly like an English message, only it's in you know ones and zeros. So if I were like, hey, Joe, hand me that wrench, okay? It's the exact same structure, right? It's a, an opening frame of, hey, you know, who you're addressing, what you want them to do, you know, what you want them to do it to, and then confirming. So it's, it's really, it's no different. And if you think of it that way, it, it makes a lot more sense. As to the function codes, we've got three of them. Uh, the first will let you read parameters off the power supply, and you can read either one or more at a time. Uh, the next one will let you write a single parameter, and we got one to write multiple parameters. Uh, now I'll point out that the uh, functions are specified by these numbers here, right? They're not the, the words read and write. You know, if you wrote your own Arduino program from scratch, you'd probably be sending the characters, you know, read and write over your serial connection and then parsing them on the far end. But for devices like this that have, you know, weak, uh, chips inside of them, it's much easier for them to parse a number and to interpret that than to have them interpret the English text of read or write. So you've got these uh, function codes instead of three, six, and 10. Now I'll also say that the leading zero X here uh, is important. You know, it's, um, it's how they specify a number in hexadecimal. Basically it's not, not super important for us to know how to work with hexadecimal, but it's important for us to know that this is hexadecimal and to make sure we include that OX when we're writing out our own Python. Just so the 
um, write bits get sent over to the power supply. Now for the data bytes, uh, those depend on what uh, function you're doing. Because obviously if you're writing a parameter, you gotta say what you wanna set it to, right? If you're saying adjust the maximum voltage, uh, then you gotta tell it what to set it to, right? And if you're saying, tell me what the maximum voltage is, then you don't need to, you know, you don't need to say because you're asking it to give you the data instead. So um, in the reading function, we've got uh, just, uh, let's see, the starting register address, and then we want to tell it how many parameters we're trying to read, right? So think of a register as a, as a parameter, and we're going to say, you know, this is the first one we want you to to uh, read off to me, and then how many to read. So if you wanna read a single one, which we'll probably be doing in most cases, we just make this extra byte here a one. Uh, now for writing, we gotta tell it what register, you know, what parameter we're writing, and then what we're writing it to. And then for writing multiple, it's uh, the starting address, and then uh, how many, let's see, how many bytes, you know, the bytes wanna to write to those. Uh, let's see, now for the registers themselves, right, for the parameters we have available, where do we find the codes for them? Well, look down here, we've got a handy dandy table, right? So it's got uh, basically every possible thing, your, your voltage setting, your current setting, your, you know, um, the, the value you're currently putting out, like what the output voltage currently is, uh, what the input voltage you're getting on the input side of this power supply is. You can control or read all of that from here, right? Some are only read, some are read and write, but you've got access to all of it from your computer. Now I'll point out here, these register addresses are also in hexadecimal, but they don't lead, start with the leading OX because instead they added H on the end instead. Just, <laughs> you know, with these import companies and their manual sometimes, uh, there, can be, there can be quirks and oddities and things that aren't, aren't very consistent. And this is one of those. So these are, these are also hexadecimal numbers and you see how they go, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then it goes to A, B, C, right? Because <laughs> that, that is how hexadecimal works. Um, but we do have access to everything we could possibly want, you know, right here at the fingertips. Over on the table, we have a 24 volt DC power supply feeding into the DPS 5020. Uh, once again, being a DC to DC buck converter, you do need to rectify the power before it comes in. And if you put AC mains straight in the back of this thing, you will fry it. Uh, also, because the maximum input voltage is 60, if you feed it more than that, even in DC volts, again, you're going to fry it. Because uh, we're feeding in 24 volts, we should be able to get out about 21 to 22, you know, and something in that ballpark, just because a buck converter will have a little bit of loss between the, uh, the input and the output. Uh, now, you might think it's kind of silly to call this thing a power supply when you do have a second power supply right behind it, but in that case, I'd argue it's also silly calling this thing a power supply, because in reality, the supply is uh, over in the underwall socket where the angry pixies come from. But anyway, that's just silly nomenclature. <laughs> Uh, now on the output, we've got a uh, electromagnet that is 24 volts rated and it will draw half an amp at that voltage. And then I can show you with the screwdriver uh, when it sticks and when it doesn't. And on the back of it here, we've got the USB cable coming over the computer with a little bit of Python that I wrote. Uh, now this is being shown in a fancy web interface called a Jupyter Notebook. But that's really, it's not super crucial, just uh, pointing it out, that's what I'm using here, uh, simply because it makes the presentation a little bit nicer. Uh, the code that's here will run just as well, uh, either in a Python terminal or as a script or anything like that. Now I will put this code up on GitHub in kind of a script you can use just to run that as a test, uh, you know, edit it, you know, try different things. And of course, you can, you know, you can copy and paste from it too, because <laughs> you can't copy and paste from a video, right? <laughs> Uh, now, in order to run this code, you will need the minimal Modbus library, which is a Python library for, you know, doing simple Modbus things. Uh, now, installing a Python library is a bit beyond the scope of this video, but if you do anything Linux, you've probably done that before already, you know, just from either your package manager, pip, or conda, or what have you. And if you don't know how to install a Python package, just take a quick look on Google and you'll find, you know, a couple answers on Stack Overflow that'll probably have you set straight. And just, it's, it's a very good skill to have because a lot of things on Linux require you to know how to install, you know, Python packages in particular. I uh, know this code is written to run on Linux primarily, but I think the only thing Linux specific is this magical string here, how you uh, specify the device you're trying to talk to. Uh, now, unfortunately, I can't really say what you'd use on Mac or Windows because I don't have any Mac or Windows machines. Basically, everything I do is on Linux. You know, I just, I got a lot of Linux here, but I don't have any Mac and Windows, so I can't be of too much more help. But I can at least explain 
uh, how you figured this out on Linux, and give you some pointers maybe for Mac and Windows. So uh, on Linux, you got the dev uh, file system. So if you go to you know CDs root slash dev, we've got all these magical files that aren't uh, actually files on your hard drive. These all correspond to different hardware devices plugged into your computer. So for example, you got like even things for your RAM, right? And basically everything, everything on here, your USB, your, your battery, all of it is accessible um, at a very low level in the dev uh, file system. And that includes our DPS5020 that appeared here underneath uh, TTY USB zero, right? Uh, now in some flavors of Linux, this might also appear as like ACM zero. There's a few other things it might appear as depending on exactly what sort of Linux you use. So if you have trouble finding it, uh, the easiest way to determine what you know, value to use is to simply check dev before you plug it in, <laughs> then plug it in, and then see what popped up new. <laughs> and then there you have your answer, right? Uh, if you want to make sure it's you know uh, a hard-coded specific string every time, there's something called udev rules. Okay, that's udev you can use uh, on Linux to you know specify that. But again, that gets kind of beyond the scope of the video. And that's really that's more important if you have other devices like Arduinos and 3D printers plugged into the same machine because they all communicate in similar ways, and they will also appear as TTY USB or ACM you know zero one two three. Um, so if, in that case, then you might look into UDEV rules, but generally speaking, it'll appear as, you know, number zero, the very first one. Uh, now, if you don't have that appearing there at all, right, that would suggest you're missing the drivers to talk to this thing. In which case, my number one tip would be to install the Arduino IDE, because the serial communication chip used on the DPS5020 is a CH340, which is the same serial driver uh, used on cheap Arduino Nano knockoffs. So when I actually saw this use the CH340, that gave me a really big boost in confidence that my Linux box could talk to it. And then I went forward and you know, pulled the trigger and bought the thing because I knew I'd at least be able to talk to it at some level and then figure out how all the mod bus and stuff works from there. So if you, uh, if you can't get it working off the cuff, try installing the, the uh, Arduino IDE, then reboot your computer and then try it again and it will almost certainly work. Now, if you're on uh, Mac or Windows, my tip would be to you know get the IDE installed and then see how that refers to your Arduino when you plug it in. And it won't be dev TTY USB zero, it'll be some other magical string. And then take that magical string and put it in to here. And that will probably have you set, okay? Let's see, so we're gonna have a uh, see, import our library, start the connection to our device file. Uh, one here says this is the first uh, device on our uh, Modbus array that up again could have up to 250 some devices and we've turned debugging off. Though I can tell you that was certainly useful when I was uh, writing this code in the first place. <laughs> now I've got uh, timeout set pretty high to one second and the baud rate set pretty low to uh, 9,600 9, bits per second. And that's because the uh, processing chip on the DPS5020 is pretty weak and pretty slow. Uh, the minimal Modbus library has a default timeout of 50 milliseconds. And in my testing, this thing took normally about 250 milliseconds in order to respond once you issued a command. So just be aware of that. It is, it is definitely not immediate, and it takes an average of quarter second, possibly up to half a second in my testing to get your answer back once you ask it you know, for a value or try to set a value. So it's not, you know, it's not super slow, but it's definitely not immediate. And that might, that might be important if you're doing certain automated things. Just, so just be aware of it. And the baud rate set low because that was mentioned somewhere uh, in the PDF documentation. So you can run all that and we can check our connection. And sure enough, it goes to dev TTY USB zero, baud rate in 600, eight bits to a byte, no parity, has a stop bit, uh, has a timeout of one second. And then all this stuff is uh, kind of beyond the scope of this video. So we'll just carry on. See, now we're going to set variables for each of the registers uh, on the DPS5020, right? Over on our PDF docs, we have this list here in the table that says what every uh, you know thing is, but they specify it as hexadecimal numbers. And us being humans, you know, we can't really read hexadecimal all that well, but a variable name is much easier for us to handle. So we just pass in... Uh, those values is specified as hex with the zero uh, x syntax, and then that will give us an easy thing to work with from here on out. Now, we're going to write uh, two settings. So we're gonna write the voltage and then write the ampered setting. And we're gonna write them to 1250. 
Now, this is kind of silly in that the DPS 5020 uses a fixed point uh, decimal number and that you basically need to add two z uh, zeros on it every time you want to set a value. So 1200 means 12 volts, 50 means 0.5 amps. Uh, now, some things used a floating point uh, variable number, like other devices. So you will see in the minimal Modbus library, there are commands for like a write float and read float, but we're not gonna use them on this device because this is only a fixed point number. So you just need to do mental math and just kind of factor in that extra uh, scale of 100 times whenever you're reading and writing to that. And now we can uh, run this and we'll see up here, these two values should change. I wonder if I can, look at that. I can zoom in while still recording, sweet. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna run this and boom, there we go. Now you might see there's a slight delay between setting the, uh, the 12 volts and the 50 or the 0.5. Uh, and that's because these are two separate lines of code and they need to run as two separate requests. But later we'll see if we can actually write these at the same time with a slightly different uh, method. And overall, I do want to point out that this is just, you know, this is much, much cleaner than what you would expect from looking at the, uh, the PDF docs, right? Like we don't need to worry about setting the address every time because you set the address, you know, way up here. We don't need to do the CRC because the library does that for us. And overall, it just makes it a much, much cleaner, simpler interface. Um, and now carrying on, we can do, uh, this guy to reader voltage setting and then reader amperage setting and just make sure we got the same values back and sure enough, 1200 and 50. Good. And now this guy will, uh, turn the switch on. So it's got the, even the ability to turn this power supply off and on remotely. And if you set the, uh, the switch register to zero, then it will turn off and set it to one, it'll turn on. So right now we got nothing. But if I run this bit of code, now the little uh, light in the corner there turned green and this will stick. And it's not super strong, you know, but it's got, it's got some magnetism to it. And that's how you control it remotely. Let's see, and now we can uh, check whether this is running uh, or no, we can check uh, our output values and see what exactly it's putting out. So running this bit of, uh, Read registers here, we get a 1201 and 0 0.22, which matches what we have on the screen. Now we'll point out this is the read registers function, right? That's plural rather than simply read register. And with the plural form of it, we can pass in the first register we wanna read and then the number of registers to read in a row and it will spit out all the values. So here we kind of luck out in that the voltage output register is uh, two and the amperage output is three, so you should read them because they're side by side. Now, if you wanted to read like the voltage setting and the voltage output, you'd have to say, give me three registers and skip the middle one because that's the amperage, right? Um, that's really just uh, an artifact of how they designed this and what values they put side by side. So in this case, you look out and we can read both the output settings in one simple command. And that way you can get both values back a little bit faster. And now we can, uh, check and see whether this runs in constant voltage or constant current mode right now. And it gives us back a zero, which is its way of signifying constant voltage. So when you set it to be 12 volts, the voltage went all the way up to the peak and then the amperage is still below its peak. So it's currently capped by having that uh, output voltage set to 12. And I hope now you're kind of maybe seeing how this plays into you know, some CNC applications. Like my, my idea here is slap this on a 3D printer and then use this for, uh, you know, ECM. And we can do that because a 3D printer is, you know, you usually talk to that using a Python program, right? Like you use um, Pronterface or Octoprint or whatever, and that's just Python code. This is just Python code. So we can combine the two and then get feedback as you go along and cut and make sure you're not, you know, moving the cutter too fast and shorting out against the work, right? Or uh, make sure you're, you're always putting out some amperage and you didn't get so far away that you're not even drawing any current anymore. And that way you can kind of monitor what your feed rate should be and when to change your, your Z to go down to the next level and keep on cutting deeper and deeper. And these things you can do because, you know, both things are just Python and they can talk and you can, you can hack it together and glue it together with duct tape and, you know, whatever to, to make it work with, uh, you know, a bit of just really awful Python code that'll, that'll come up in a future video. But anyway, uh, back to uh, running this awful Python code. Uh, now we're going to set the uh, amperage cap to be 0.1 amps 
And then we're going to check what our output is. So we ran this, uh, we got 7.4 volts and 0.13 amps, which does not agree with what is on the screen. So what exactly happened there? Well, <laughs> the thing is we read the output values immediately after setting a new amperage maximum. So it was still in the process of changing, right? Like we set that value and then it started dropping, but it took a moment uh, you know, for it to happen. And in that time we read it and we got uh, you know, those intermediary values. Where if we read the output values again, now they agree with six volts and 0.1 amps. So just be aware of that too. If you're changing a setting, it will take another fraction of a second in order to uh, you know, have that setting kick in. And now we've got the, um, the voltage here also dropped by factor two because now it's being capped by the amperage, right? Because now uh, basically if the way electromagnet works as a, a simple resistor almost, uh, since we're making it draw half as many amps by uh, you know, enabling a 0 0.10 amp maximum, the voltage this machine puts out is gonna be cut in half as well, even though we're letting it put up to 12 because naturally this thing only draws uh, you know, 0.1 amps at six volts. And sure enough, we can see this is also much, much weaker. Well, I guess you can't see, but I can kind of feel that it does stick, but it's very, oh, there you go. You get just a little bit of pickup on it. It's very, very weak now, which does, uh, does make sense. And now if we check whether it's constant voltage, con constant current, it comes back with a one, meaning now it is in constant current mode, right? It's, it's butting up with that 0.1 against the 0.1 maximum we set there. See, uh, next up, we're gonna try setting the output maximum uh, voltage to 24, and then run that and see what we get. And it gives us 12. And up here, it didn't change. So what's the deal, right? <laughs> well, I found that this power supply uh, will ignore your voltage set command if it comes too close to the voltage input down here. So we're feeding in 24.36 volts, and if we try to feed in any more than 23.35, right? So it needs to be at least one whole volt less than the input. If you try to set it to be any higher than that, it will just straight up ignore the command. Won't even, won't even try to do it. So just be aware of that as well. You know, you need to um, make sure you're not requesting more volts than this thing could possibly put out. So now if we adjust it and we do it again, saying only 23 volts maximum output, and we read the setting, the setting did indeed change and we got the 23 that we expected. Uh, let's see, now we can check uh, register five, which was, what was that again? Oh, the input voltage, right. <laughs> Didn't get on a variable before, variable before. So uh, this is how we can check our input voltage in a program to make sure we don't request uh, a higher voltage output than we should, right? And we can get back, that is getting 24.36 volts in the input, just as we expect, right? Because it says it right there, and that uh, power supply in the back is nominally 24 volts. I guess 24.36 to be precise. Let's see. Now if we set the uh, maximum amperage output to be zero, and we check whether it's in constant current or constant amperage mode, we will get back that it is still in constant current mode, even though it's is basically off now, right? The amperage has dropped to effectively zero. Uh, there's gonna be <laughs> effectively no magnetism, magnetism at all. It is still technically capped by uh, that maximum amperage output. And you know you might still get a little bit of residual because we haven't turned it off off. We've only turned it off by dropping the maximum amperage you know, as, as low down as we possibly could. And now if we read the, uh, the current output, it gives us just as we expect. Uh, you know, one volt and that uh, 0.01 uh, amps. In fact, I want to add one extra thing in here too. Uh, and that, do a connection, uh, right, register, amp set, and then set that to one amp maximum. And now we'll see that it uh, hopped up to, you know, 0.38. And if we check our output settings again, we get that now it's putting out 20 volts and 0.37 amps, and it's gone back to being in constant voltage mode, because now we've set the, um, the voltage uh, maximum low enough 
that given our amperage maximum, it will keep going you know, all the way up to there. And if we uh, adjust that, let's see, uh, output voltage one more time, back to 2300, we should see it squeeze out even a little bit more power, right? All the way up to 0.39 amps now, but it didn't even get any higher than 21.35. And again, that's because this thing is a buck converter, um, not, you know, it won't give you full rail to rail voltage. So even though we can set it to say 23, it might not give it to you depending on what your input is. And if you check whether you're in constant voltage or constant current mode now, it will give you back uh, constant current, even though really it's, it's not limited by either. In this case, it's kind of confused thinking it's constant uh, current limited, uh, even though you know, it's, it's really hitting neither cap and it's hitting more a cap based on the input of the device. So one other thing you want to do is once you, uh, you know, set your values and then you, uh, you know, expect to get a certain value, just double check and make sure that you can't even get as high of a voltage that you set because it will stop you from setting anything uh, higher than, I guess, what, the 23.35 in this case. But even though it'll let you set it to somewhere in the 21, 22 range, you might not get that just depending on, you know, your specific device. And I think with all that now, we can set the switch to be zero, you know, check that currently it is on and it is much stronger than it was before. And then if we run this bit of code, off it goes, boom. So I hope that helps you out with, uh, you know, just basic testing this thing and gives you some ideas of ways you might use it in your shop. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to trying it more with mine. Again, with the ECM and some anodizing and electrolysis things I've been meaning to do for forever. But, uh, That'll be good for now. And we have another video coming up in just a little while on how to assemble this guy a bit easier because the instructions it comes with and the parts it comes with kind of are a pain in the ass. So just look out for that. And uh, until that video, peace.